I want to welcome you to session six of Your Place on God's Dream Team, The Making of Champions. I'm enjoying these sessions with you, and I, again, my prayer for you is that you and your team will take this information and apply it and integrate it into what you are doing for God and that together you'll become a better team because of it. We need to go back to the foundation and remember that Jesus prayed for us, the church, that we would be one. And I realize that's probably never going to be a universal doctrinal one. We're all going to have little different beliefs here and there about all kinds of different things. But on a local level, we can functionally be one. We can be a team. And as Jesus prayed, we can have the same kind of teamwork that he and the Father shared and likewise the Holy Spirit. And so we've talked about uh, the traits of champions, and that's what we're continuing. Uh, the letter C stands for composure, H for humility, A for authenticity, M for motivation. And I think you can readily see that if we have composure, self-control, if we have humility, if we are walking in real authenticity, we're, we're uh, being true to the gifts and the callings of God in our life and serving God accordingly. And if we're motivated, we're going we're gonna to be on our way to a championship team. But in this session, we want to look at the trait of persistence. Persistence is a trait of champions. If motivation will get you going, then persistence will keep you going. Uh, one thing that we need to understand is that championships don't happen just in a second or in a moment. Uh, championship performances are based on teams that are committed for the long haul, uh, for people that are really committed to enduring and persevering and not giving up easily. Uh, those traits of tenacity and persistence are just you know, absolutely essential for a championship performance. Jesse Owens, one of the great uh, Olympic athletes in American history, uh, won four gold medals at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. He made this statement, and it to me speaks so powerfully about the power of persistence. He said, there is something that can happen to every athlete and every human being. The instinct to slack off, to give in to pain, to give less than your best, the instinct to hope you can win uh, through your opponent not doing his best instead of going to the limit and past your limit where victory is always found. Defeating those negative instincts that are out to defeat us is the difference between winning and losing, and we all face that battle every day. I think Jesse Owens did such a great job of describing that. There's always that tendency just to get tired, to get weary, uh, just to compromise, to coast, to you know, just not give a hundred percent or not give your absolute best. And, and we need to understand that God hasn't just called us to be great starters, uh, but God has called us to be strong finishers. I love something that Bear Bryant said, you know, he, he was the legendary coach at Alabama football for so many years. And, and Bear Bryant said this, he said, don't give up at halftime, concentrate on winning the second half. And I don't know about you, you may be just starting out serving God. And I, I've had the privilege of serving God for uh, three and a half decades now. And, um, you know, we just need to make sure that we don't ever get comfortable, get lax, uh, decide we're just going to coast on past momentum. Uh, God deserves our best every day. And our energies, our strength needs to be renewed and we need to be persistent people. One of the things I've noticed in watching professional sports and especially football is how that some people tend to, you know, they, they're running for a touchdown and they, they tend to slow up the last several yards and, and occasionally they pay a price for it. Uh, way back in the 1990s, there was a a Super Bowl game going on, and one of the great defensive linemen in football at that time, uh, 
in, in a Super Bowl, picked up a fumble and ran 65 yards for what appeared to be an, a, a certain touchdown. And as this defensive lineman was approaching the uh, end zone uh, for the touchdown, he, he slowed up just a little bit and he stretched out both arms and the football was in one of the arms in one of his hands. He was, he was kind of beginning, I think, to prepare to celebrate in the end zone. And this football player, great player, later said that he actually kind of was watching himself on the big screen, on the jumbotron. And so uh, when he stretched out both hands uh, right before he crossed the end zone line, what he didn't realize is that one of the other players on the other team had been chasing him down for 65 yards. And right when he stretched his, his hands out with the football in it, uh, that other player was able to slap the football out and, you know, it went rolling out of the end zone. He lost his opportunity for a Super Bowl touchdown just because he, he didn't finish strong. He didn't stay focused until the very, very end. And, you know, one of the things that we see in Scripture continually is the admonition, don't grow weary in well-doing. In Revelation chapter 2, one of the great churches uh, in the Bible, the church of Ephesus, um, if you know anything about church history, you know this was a mega church. This was a powerhouse church. And Jesus, in speaking to them in Revelation chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5, he said, nevertheless, I have this against you. And this is after he had listed all these wonderful traits, all these wonderful characteristics of things that this church was doing well. He says, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Um, I don't mean for this lesson to come across as threatening in any way, shape, or form. That's not our purpose. But I do want to stress this. It doesn't matter how well we've done up to this point. We cannot rest on past successes. Uh, we cannot be uh, intimidated by past failures. Uh, today is a brand new day, and we can't coast in the past or rely on the past, we have to press in and, and persevere and be persistent until the finish line. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, well, let me give you a verse from Romans first. In Romans 12, 11, in the message version, it says, don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. That's in the message. The amplified version renders that same verse, never lag in zeal. And in earnest endeavor, be aglow and burning with the Spirit, serving the Lord. You know, one of the very important books of the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, uh, was written to believers who had uh, gone a certain distance in their journey. And uh, they were facing persecution because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and there was a tendency to let up. Uh, to coast and even to regress. And uh, the author of Hebrews said some pretty powerful things to them. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1, and all of this connects to the idea of persistence. He said, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. And in Hebrews 3, 6, he talked about uh, the idea of holding fast uh, the confidence that we have and the rejoicing of our hope. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, again, there's a reference to holding fast, holding the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the very end. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, he says, do not cast away your confidence. 
And so I want to encourage you in this lesson that uh, we need to be people of persistence. We need to be people that don't just start strong or start well, but we should actually be increasing in momentum. We should be increasing in fervor, in intensity, in fruitfulness, in excitement. I hope that you're not the kind of person that is content if you're just doing as well as you did last year. Uh, we should be seeing increase. Uh, the Bible talks about how that we as believers are to go from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from glory to glory. And so we need to be people of persistence. Let me give you three areas that our persistence should really show up in. First of all, we should be people that persist in the face of discouragement. You know, uh, there are times in life where the results are not what we would like to see. Uh, our productivity, our fruitfulness is not what it should be. And what are we going to do about that? Are we going to get discouraged and back off? Or are we going to persist until we get the kind of results, the kind of fruitfulness, and the kind of productivity that God wants us to have? Because God wants us to be fruitful. That was the one thing Jesus said is that, is that we were to have fruit and that our fruit was to remain. When I think of someone who is persistent in the face of discouragement, uh, a couple of the people that come to mind are some of the early pioneers in the modern missionary movement. Adoniram Judson, for example, uh, he was born in the late 1700s, and, and he had it on his heart. He had a call from God to go to the nation of Burma. And he went to the nation of Burma when there was not a single known Christian in the entire country. And this is before missionaries were, you know, going around the globe. This is very early in the days of the modern missionary movement. And when he went to Burma, he actually labored there, preached and worked among the Burmese people for six horrifically difficult years before he ever saw a single convert. When he had been there 11 years, he had had a, a total of 20 people pray and accept the Lord Jesus. Uh, but by the time he had spent 38 years in Burma, had translated the Bible into the Burmese language, uh, converts began to multiply. And several years after his death, the Burmese government did a survey and found there were 210,000 Christians in the nation. But what if Adoniram Judson had gotten weary? What if he had gotten discouraged in that situation of not having productivity, not having fruitfulness, and what if he had just decided to quit? Thank God that he didn't. Likewise, William Carey labored in India for seven years before he had his first convert. Let me just encourage you. It's, it's a good thing to start, but it's a great thing to finish, and it's a great thing to endure and persist in doing what God has called us to do. We have to persist in the face of discouragement. Secondly, we have to persist in the face of the mundane. I, I'm amazed how many people tell me that they don't feel like what they do for God is very exciting. Um, they feel like, well, I'm just doing this. I'm just, and you know, they'll kind of minimize and downplay the significance of what they do. And let me just encourage you that everything that is done for the, for the church, everything that is done for the glory of God is valuable, important, and significant. Don't let anybody tell you that what you're doing, whether you're an usher, you work with children, Whatever you do, it is vital and it is important. I think the devil always wants to communicate to us that, that the grass is always greener on the other side. But let me tell you, what you're doing is valuable and important. You know, you stop and think about your physical body. You know, lungs, for example. You know, what your lungs do, probably to your lungs, doesn't seem very exciting. You know, how many years have your lungs been doing, you know, two things, air in, air out, 
air in, air out. And, you know, your lungs could complain, you know, I, I just don't feel like what I do is very exciting. Well, it may not seem exciting to them, but for the rest of your body, uh, we are thankful for the, the fact that our lungs keep taking air in and air out. So just realize that you need to stay focused. You need to be persistent, even if you feel like what you're doing is not, you know, the most exciting thing in the world. Uh, you are blessing somebody. You are helping somebody. Uh, you're a vital part of the success of your team. And then finally, we need to be persistent in the face of failure, persistent in the face of failure. I like what Michael Jordan said. He said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. He said, I failed over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. Great statement and a great attitude. Uh, he didn't get it right every time. He made mistakes. He, he missed it at times, uh, but he kept persisting, and he had a whole lot of successes. And we need to understand that the great men and the great women of God in the Bible are not individuals who never made a mistake, who never failed, but they were people who, even if they fell, they got up and they kept going. I want to encourage you today that if we're going to be champions, we have to be persistent. You know, your longevity, your experience, uh, the, the seasoning that you have in your work for God is something that the team needs. Uh, it's hard to build a successful team when people just keep changing off and on. And on one hand, I know that's part of what we deal with in any team. You know, you have to be ready to face changes and things like that. And we have to keep pursuing, even if it's a rebuilding year. But when you give the gift of longevity to your pastor and to your team, you give a great gift because the more we know one another, the more we persist in our work, uh, the more we're able to function effectively because we know the culture, we know the system, we know the plan, we know the purpose and things of that nature. So longevity is a great gift, but longevity will never be achieved if we don't walk in persistence. Persistence is one of the great traits of a championship team, and I pray that you're walking in persistence. God bless you. Persistency. You don't need to see me. You just need to hear me. It's way better. Thank you. That's not because I'm, what was it? Pop. Popable. Popable. Okay. Now, what did you take from lesson number six? Before you start, let me ask you another question. How many of you can remember a time where you started strong and you finished weak? Be honest. I can lift my hand, that's sure. There's at least one time in each and every one of our lives where we've actually, were really motivated, like the idea, everything, and yeah, let's go, and we start so strong, and then we just kind of get weaker and weaker and weaker. So if we truly believe in our idea, that does make us possibly self-starter. Yeah. That does give us the right motivation, the right passion, everything that goes with that. But without persistence, it just kind of fades. 
Now we are talking about God's dream team. Yeah? And if you are composed, if you are humble, yeah, if you are authentic, if you are motivated, that all helps. But without this, it just does not continue. 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 Does not continue. <laughs> you get the point? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It just, thank you so much. No, but really, it just stops. And what most of us usually do is we start pointing fingers, start making excuses, start saying, oh, it didn't go as well as I thought it would because of this law, because of the people who were supposed to help let me down. And, yeah? And it's... So... Without persistency, we forget composure, we forget humility, and motivation and authenticity. All I wanted to say is the importance of that word right in the middle there. That it's great to have motivation. Yeah? But we can have that because we hear something, because we believe in something. Yeah? But if we don't continue 